So hello, everyone. Um, a warm welcome to everybody attending my presentation here live, as well as everybody tuning in online. Um, I currently work as an artist in the gaming industry, uh, and I have previous experience in the visual effects industry. However, today I will be talking about how I mix 2D with 3D in my personal art style, and how I use ZBrush to create illustrations. In this presentation, I will go over the development of my art style, some style and technique inspirations, as well as my chosen pipeline, and the result and application of my work. The latter part will be demonstrated through the recorded process of the illustration that I have shown here called the Orange Sorceress. So beginning with the development, uh, for me, it all started with drawing. I have been drawing ever since I was little and I could hold a pencil. And the continuous practice and uh, as well as studying of art throughout my life is what led me to pursue art professionally. So I got a bachelor's degree in 3D production and visual effects, and I specialized in stylized character creation. Now, part of 3D character creation is digital sculpting. And this is how I got introduced to the software during my sculpting classes in uni. Honestly, it was love at first sight, so I immediately fell in love with the software, and I have been using it ever since. Now, to me, sculpting in ZBrush while using a digital tablet is the ultimate experience of blending 3D creation with the standard feeling of drawing that you get when you draw on paper. Uh, that's why I love it so much, and I like to practice it in this way. So my earliest work in ZBrush was uh, mainly realistic characters, after which I moved on to creating more stylized characters and assets and developing my style further. I have used ZBrush as well as Cinema 4D and Redshift to design, create, rig, uh, animate, and render characters professionally. And in my experience so far, 2D and 3D art have uh, been two separate things for the most part. So what I mean by this is that typically a final product is either um, predominantly 2D, for example, concept art, a poster, or a recorded video with some effects in it, or predominantly 3D, such as a fully 3D rendered video uh, or stills. There are, of course, exceptions, such as hand-painted textures or 3D effects blended with recorded footage. But for me, in my personal work, I wanted to find a way that not only takes bits and pieces of 2D and 3D and incorporates it into each other, but really visually blends the style of both. Now, before figuring out how to do that, I took a look at how other artists approach creating a blended-looking style. Now, firstly, some style inspirations. So when it comes to uh, types of art that I enjoy consuming as well as producing, there are three main categories. I really love 3D stylized characters and assets, 2D flat color illustrations, and print design. So I love all three, and I want to create a combination of all three. So that means I have to make sure I'm using both 2D and 3D techniques, um, and that the end product can be a standalone product or be convertible to variations of products. So let's take a look at some art inspirations. So one method uh, shown here is with this example of a Luigi concept art created by Alvaro Suazo and a 3D model based on it created by Alexander Mugeno. Now in the art station post, Alexander writes, everything was done in CGI. I just used Photoshop to create the chromatic aberration and bring up the brightness a bit. So um, painting in 2D, uh, 2D strokes and shapes onto the model directly is one way of creating this blended look at style that Alexander has formed. Another method is that of Tyler Pate. So he likes to create orthographic looking artworks and he begins with a sketch. Afterwards, he moves on to creating his base shapes in Adobe Illustrator. And finally, he adds a texture overlay and he paints details over in Photoshop. So I have taken inspiration from both of these techniques, and I have decided to combine aspects of them together with my already existing skills and knowledge to create a pipeline that works well for me. So the pipeline I have created to form an illustration from idea to final product consists of four parts. So firstly, I begin with creating a concept sketch. Then I move on to uh, sculpting my character in ZBrush and coloring it. Then I create a 3D render. And in the end, I, similarly to Tyler Pate, create a texture overlay in, Z uh, in Photoshop. Now, begin with the concept sketch. Um, when coming up with a concept, the first thing I do is I think of a few keywords, and I try to form the idea around those keywords. So for this particular illustration, the two keywords were orange and a magician. 
so once I have chosen my words, I go ahead and create a uh, border of references that I use as I'm sketching. Um, as a personal preference, I like to do my sketches on a smaller tablet, since I can bring it around. And if I feel inspired, oh, there's something cool. Let me sketch it real quick. Um, so this following video will be uh, created on the smaller tablet. And one thing I'd like to mention here is that creating an illustration from start to finish can take several hours. So I will be showing you sped up uh, recorded videos of the process. So from the references I have gathered, I chose one main image for the pose of the character, and I begin sketching it out. So I start with rough burst strokes to get the general pose and shapes in. Once I've sketched out the body, I continue with designing the face, the hair, and the dec decorative assets. I look at multiple images from the reference board as I'm sketching, and I pick bits and pieces from them to try and incorporate into the design. So I experiment with the hair, the clothing, the accessories, until I find a combination of shapes that I like. Now, in this particular artwork, since orange is one of the keywords, I try to incorporate the orange into multiple areas of the design. So not only the shape of an orange, but also the colors, which are reflected in the color palette I have chosen. So this character is a sorceress, uh, so I <laughs> decided to add a magic book to emphasize that. Um, so here you will see me adjusting small details to the clothing and just experimenting. Oh, she's a magician. Let me try another hat. Mm, it doesn't really work. Let's erase it. So I go ahead and repeat this process until I'm satisfied with the sketch. Um, what I like to do is also to, um, once I have figured out which parts of the clothing I want to do, as you see me doing here, we add a little bag. And once that is done, I like to flip my image horizontally so I can check if there's areas of the design that I would like to improve, such as the face, as you see here. And once it looks good in the mirrored image, I would go ahead and flip it back to its original state. Now, the next step for me is to create a silhouette of my character. Now, this helps me clearly identify the outline and the volume of the character um, to make sure the design is readable in the silhouette, because a good design should be clear and easy to be perceived by the viewer. So here you see I duplicate the braid. I go ahead and form uh, just the general outline. And once I'm done with that, I will use the same silhouette layer to fill in the base colors. So I have chosen a color palette, like I said, which fits with the orange theme. So I go ahead and block out areas of the skin. Then I will also color in the hair, just basic uh, colors, no nothing fancy in terms of shading, since uh, ultimately this sketch is just uh, the idea for the final product. So I will go ahead and uh, block in the parts that have yellow, the orange, the blue, and the green. And once I am satisfied with that, I will go ahead and finish the concept by adding details such as the eyes, the nose, the lips, the nails, and uh, the little shapes that you see inside of the orange. So this is just to give me an idea where to go with the sculpting at the next stage. So go ahead, add some eyebrows, some eyes. Add the earrings, nails, little detail on the book, background shapes, and voila, the sketch is done. The next step is to create my digital sculpture in ZBrush. Uh, the sculpt is done on my laptop using a bigger display tablet. Uh, I'd like to mention in the beginning it will seem like the sculpture goes a bit quicker, but towards the end it's a bit slower. So let's begin. So I like to begin sculpting by using the default character models inside of ZBrush as a base for the pose. So here I have opened the female base character. Uh, and as I'm positioning it, I also like to leave my sketch on top of the screen to reference as I do this. Uh, I start by positioning the model into the pose that I have in my concept. Um, so I do that by masking areas of the body and moving their pivot point around the point I want to rotate, which is usually a joint. So that would be the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist. Um, what I do here is also I separate the head from the body, and I keep them as two separate meshes, because throughout the sculpting process, I can use the zero measure uh, as fits best for each. Uh, the topology of the head, I leave symmetrical, so it's handy to just keep them separate. So here I'm just slightly positioning the head, getting it uh, as a rough base to match the concept. Now, what I'd like to say here is that um, normally in a typical 3D production pipeline, a character is sculpted symmetrically in an A or a T pose. 
so that's just uh, an easier and faster way to go about it. Um, and the purpose is that you can easily rig it and animate it later. But in this case, the final goal is not that. It's an illustration, so I can already position my character in the pose that it needs to be. I don't need to rig it, um, so I go ahead and do that for this sculpt. Now, once I have positioned the body, I proceed to focus on the head. So I'm going to go ahead and add eyes, eyebrows, ears, lips, and eyelids as the main features of the shape. Then I'm going to begin and build up uh, shapes of the face uh, with simple volumes. Um, and I do this because my character was stylized. So blocking out with uh, simpler shapes is the best way for me to create more stylized shapes instead of taking a real face and trying to make it morph into a stylized one. So this way, I just simplify the shapes that I see. Um, so to form these shapes, I start with a sphere. Um, and I sculpt it into the base for the cheeks, the chin, nose, and eyelids. I go ahead and add a neck, uh, and I adjust, uh, adjust the shapes further using the move and smooth brushes predominantly. I also like to use the inflate, uh, the clay, the clay buildup, the damp standard, and the pinch brushes. So here I'm just tweaking uh, little parts to make it look as simple as possible, since that's the style I'm going for. Simple tweaks, a uh, little area bridge between the nose and the cheeks. And now once I have that, um, I will move on to create the prominent features of the concept. So a main feature here is the hair. So I'm going to start by building the top part of the hair, again, from spheres. I move them around, I inflate them, I shape them into the sketch, and I make it work in 3D. So when I sculpt, I try to think of the biggest, most simplest shapes that I can break down an object into. So I would take a sphere, you know, duplicate it, sculpt it a little bit, use the Z measure as I'm sculpting to restructure the geometry, and then I would repeat the same process again. So if I would uh, stretch the geometry too much, that's a correct moment to use a uh, zero measure. So then here I'm going to go ahead and create a base for the hat. It's just two simple shapes, again, <laughs> from a sphere. Um, so it doesn't need to be too detailed, just the base of it works perfectly fine. I'm going to go ahead and also create a thinner, more sharp line around the edges of the hat, make sure it looks predominantly good from the front, because that's going to be the final result, but also make sure it looks good from the sides as well. And then once I'm satisfied with this base, I will go ahead and work on the orange slices because they're an important part of the design. So for this, I take a sphere and I flatten the sides. Then I create the inside slices with rounded corners to fit the more cuter style that I'm going for. Um, so in the sketch, you can see that I drew more inner shapes, but in 3D, um, it looked better to have less. So as I sculpt, I also take into account what works better to translate a 2D sketch into 3D, and I make decisions accordingly. So it's not because I've drawn six shapes that I will exactly do six. It's just whatever looks better. Um, so for shapes like this, um, the rim that we have around the orange, I will go ahead and use the polish option under the deformation tab because it polishes everything uniformly. So I would use the smooth brush, but also the generic deformation option. So once I'm done with the slice, uh, one thing to add is a little detail. So you have this very tiny seed, which seems like a detail, but it will be visible in the end. So I go ahead and make sure that I have this seed correctly placed. Now once I'm done with the orange slice, I'm going to go ahead and merge all objects that form it into one, so that I can duplicate it and reuse it in an easier way. So for this process, I like to use the polyg polygon fill preview, which highlights my selected objects in a color. So it's just an easier way to make sure I'm selecting the correct objects and merging them together. So you can see me doing that here. And once that's done, I will put my slice to the side and begin duplicating it. So I start by placing it on the hat. It's one of the biggest slices that you see. Then I'll go ahead and duplicate it and place it for the earrings. Now, at this point, I'm thinking, OK, there's other places where I can use the orange slice, but the body that I have is just the base reference. So I need to first structure a good stylized body that fits the shape. So I'm going to pause on the oranges and move on to the body. So I will continue here by blocking out the body using spheres again <laughs> um, on top of the base mesh that I positioned in the beginning. So I'm going to block out the upper torso, the arms, the shoulders, the chest, the waist, hips, and top of the legs. So in the end, I will not be able to see the legs, but having that position in place guides me to create the clothing better. So I make sure to have it underneath, even if it's not visible in the end. So here, I'm going ahead and just simply 
moving the shapes a little bit, uh, predominantly using the move brush again. Um, now for the hand that's reaching in the front, that was a bit more complicated, so I just made a base here, which will not be used in the end. Again, it's just a guideline for the final result. So go ahead and I create some little fingers, position it. And there we go, we have the base for the body. So once I'm happy with this, I'm going to continue to another main shape, which is the braid. Now, braids are rather complicated to, to do, at least visually at first. So to simplify it, I use half a sphere, and I just duplicate it like that. So this just gives me an idea, OK, that's kind of what like, a braid looks like. So then I'm going to go ahead and actually create one shape, which um, shows the structure of the braid. And I will position it on top, as you can see. And I will use the same object to just duplicate and make it seem like the braid is twisting into each other. Now, an important thing to mention here is that most of the spheres I work with are rather lower poly, but I use the dynamic subdivision option to preview them as higher poly while I'm working. So I will turn this preview on when I'm making slight adjustments, and I will turn it off if I'm making really big adjustments. So ultimately, the actual topology of this is lower, but it just seems higher while I'm sculpting. So once I'm done with the braid, I'm going to merge it together and duplicate uh, and position both braids uh, into place according to the concept. Now, since I have the base of the stylized body, I can go ahead and move on to the clothing. I create the base of the scarf and the base of the skirt. So as you can see, when you use the move brush, uh, the topology tends to look a bit jaggedy, but that's OK, because we have the smoothing brushes. So here, um, I'm creating some of the base. So you see me turn on and off the dynamic subdivision preview for the skirt. I'm also creating the belt, because it's a rather larger shape of the design. So it's very tiny tweaks here and there. So I would move something zero mesh, move something zero mesh. And in terms of the setting of the zero mesher, I just you typically select the same option. So it keeps the topology the same, unless I need to reduce it further. Um, so at this point, um, it's time to use a DynaMesh. So I merge all objects that form the upper body into one object, but I also apply the DynaMesh. So that means that the topology merges into one object, so I can go ahead and smooth it better. And then I would use the zero measure to decrease the geometry. So I do this process for the upper body, and then I go ahead and do it for the face. So here, all those shapes that I had in the beginning blend into one, and I can very easily smooth the areas in between. So you can see this is uh, a rather quicker way to create stylized shapes. So I would smooth out the areas around the nose and then emphasize other parts, such as the lips and the nose. And voila, that's how I would create the face. So just little tweaks here and there. Adjust the eyebrows a little bit. So at this point, I'm going to um, go back to the clothing and work a little bit on the top. I'm adjusting it to fit the shape of the body. So when I move it, you can see there's some creasing. No problem. We'll just use the zero measure. So just move slightly, zero mesh, move slightly, zero mesh. Um, I do the same for the belt. And at this point, uh, I can begin to focus more on details. So what I'm going to go do uh, here is create the little detail we have in the concept over here. And the easiest way to do that is to mask the area where you want that to be, extract the geometry. Again, looks a bit jaggedy, no problem, smooth it out. Uh, so I go ahead and do that. And here we have the detail of the belt. And finally, I can go ahead and add my orange slice to it. I have also added the bag at this point, because it's a rather larger uh, shape, so it's good to have it already in the scene. Um, I go ahead and take a sphere, stretch it all the way up, and then I make sure that the strap wraps nicely around the body. Uh, again, this is going to mess with your topology, but zero measure is there to save the day. So here, normally, of course, this is one strap, but it's easier to just create the front of the strap and then go ahead and duplicate it for the back of it. So you will see me do that right now. I just go ahead, mirror it to the back side, and even though you won't see the back side as much in the end, it's just nice to make it follow the shape for the, <laughs> for the shading. Little tweaks. Ah, making sure the bag looks like it's a bit heavy, floating down. Save your project, very important. <laughs> now, uh, here I'm going to go ahead and add the leaf shape. It's very basic. I didn't want to draw attention to it, so it's just a very simple shape that I go ahead and add there. 
Now moving on to the book. So I form the base of the book again from spheres and I place it in the hand of the character. And then I adjust the fingers slightly so it really looks like the character is holding the book. Um, once I have done that, I'm going to continue to the arm and apply the same dynamesh technique. So all the objects, as you can see here, we have three objects forming the arm. I'm going to merge them together, uh, use dynamesh to merge the topology, and then zero measure to lower it. So here I'm going to go ahead and slightly scope the arm, just make sure it looks more like an arm, <laughs> pretty much, instead of a cylinder. Um, scope a little bit of the elbow, add a bit more volume. And once I have done it for the arm, I will also add the wrist. Again, same thing. Uh, Dynamesh, zero mesh sculpt. Uh, here I will go ahead and adjust the fingers a little bit more. And once I'm happy with that, I will also merge the wrist into the rest of the arm. And that's also visible with the poly preview. So if your object has the same color, usually uh, once you have Dynamesh, that means, OK, you've done a good job. It's one object merged together. So here, I'm going to go ahead and focus a little bit on the fingers. So since I took the arm from the base female mesh, it's more realistic, but I want to simplify it a bit more. So I'm going to inflate the fingers a little bit. Um, go ahead and also emphasize the fact that they're folding, so just flatten them out a little bit. Uh, and just very slight adjustments to, to the style. It doesn't need to be too realistic, because the style can afford for it to not be extreme realistic. So very slight tweaks. Now, I'm doing this process for one of the arms. And like I mentioned earlier, in a typical uh, production pipeline, you can only do one arm, mirror it, the other arm. But in this case, I just enjoy sculpting. So why not do it for both arms? So I'm going to go ahead and focus on the right arm. Uh, again, the same process. I will merge all the shapes together, start sculpting them. At this point, I thought, well, this is 3D. Can't I copy something? Of course, let's just copy the hand. So I go ahead and copy the hand, flip it around and put it in place. Make sure uh, I add a little sphere there to make sure that there's enough uh, geometry for the program to work with for the wrist. I go ahead, merge it all together, and here I do very slight adjustments. So nothing too crazy, nothing um, super you know, stretching the geometry too much, just very slight tweaks. Um, also, to distinguish between the two hands, I go ahead and position the fingers um, a bit with the same technique I mentioned in the end, which is just uh, masking an area and moving that slightly. And once I have done that, I can go ahead and take both arms and merge it with the torso. Same technique. So I merge them together. I use Dynamesh and um, zero measure to lower the topology. Because usually with Dynamesh, if you want a smooth result, you have to crank up the settings. But then you end up with a lot of millions of polygons, which you ultimately don't need. Um, so once I have zero meshed, I go ahead and tweak the topology a little bit. And I smooth out areas of the body as well to make it look like it's one uh, consistent piece. Now, the next part here is to create the gloves. Um, so I'm using a similar technique. I'm masking the area around the hands where the gloves will be, and I go ahead and I extract that. But as you can see, you get some artifacts in the topology. So I get a, some holes where you have the fingers. So uh, a little trick I like to do there is use the inflate brush. So I just inflate the topology a little bit, zero mesh it again, inflate, zero mesh, and then uh, that way I can end up with a cleaner topology. So here, as you can see, uh, it looks a bit chunky, so I'm going to go ahead and use the H polish brush to flatten the top and make sure there's like a nice line around the fingers. Very slight tweaks again. Again, this is all uh, done using the dynamic subdivision preview on, so that's what makes it look smooth as I'm going about the sculpting. So I have done this for the left glove, uh, and once I'm done with that, I'm going to go ahead and repeat the process for the right. Uh, one thing I wanted to do here is, in the end of the render, I wanted to have a nice outline to make sure that the gloves are visible, uh, but not too big so that they look bigger than the hands. Saving my project. Yes, moving on to the other hand. So again, here you see the little artifacts, but once you have used Dynamesh a couple of times, the topology gets fixed. So I flatten it again, create a nice rim around the fingers, very slight adjustment. So while I'm sculpting, you can also see me rotate from a lot of angles. It's just to make sure that does it look good from this angle, does it look good from that angle. Um, and also, it's easier for the brush to work in that way. So at this point, I have most of my clothing in. So what can I do next is I can proceed to create the nails. So they're a little bit of a detail, but they will be visible in the end. 
So in a similar way, I'm going to mask out the areas where the nails are going to be. I'm going to extract that, which just means it's going to duplicate just that geometry that I've masked. And then I'm going to go ahead and use the Move and the Smooth brush to position them better. So as you can see, they're a little bit uh, too big for the finger. So with very slight adjustments, I make sure they're, uh, they fit the finger nicely, that they're long enough and visible enough. And I go ahead and do that for each finger, also on both hands. An important thing to mention here when doing nails is often when you extract, you're going to have this geometry that pops out of, the like out of the original mesh. But in reality, your nails come out of your fingers. So you have to make sure to like push the backside in to make it look not realistic, but more like believable. Now, once I have done that, uh, I'm going to continue with adding the orange slices on top of the book, just, I have on the, uh, just like I have in the concept. So I go ahead and do that. I have one full slice and then two half ones, duplicating them and positioning them. Then I will go ahead and add the same slice to the bag. So I have this little detail going on here. I'm going to use the inner side on the bag. Again, as you can see, it's only four instead of five. Looks good enough. Leave it like that. <laughs> Uh, once I have done that, I'm going to continue with the book. So I take the cover, I duplicate it, and I scale it down a little bit, and voila, we have pages. So I try to reuse as much of the geometry that I have already in the scene. Uh, I'm going to add the little details to the book. And at this point, um, I go back to the face and start adjusting very small parts of the sculpting. So that's more like a touch-up face. I do that for the face, the hair, the skirt. So I tend to zoom in on the face and then zoom out a little bit. Um, and honestly, tweak it until I'm happy with the way that it looks. So another thing I noticed I could do here is uh, flatten the bottom of the skirt. So that's what I'm doing there. And I'm also going to go ahead and use the H polish brush to um, make the straps of the back thinner. Um, here you have to be careful because with the H polish, you can create a very, very thin looking geometry. But no worries, you can go ahead and inflate it later. So I just make sure it still looks thick enough to be a strap of the bag. So go ahead and do that for both parts. I also flattened the um, shape of the pages a little bit. You can only see the top part, so that's good enough for that. Um, at this point, I <laughs> went back to the nails because I was like, mm, well, when you zoom out, they're not that visible. So I decided to go back into them and just slightly make them longer. Um, it's also a cool trick because when you make female characters that can emphasize like the pose that they're trying to get, it draws attention, especially if you have a contrast between the skin color and the nail color. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And once I'm happy with this, it's time for a little bit of file organization. So I'm going to look at uh, my file structure and I'm going to group some objects in folders. And I'm also going to hide objects that are no longer necessary and not part of the sculpt. So at this point, this is where I also prepare my sculpt for painting. So objects that will have the same color, for example, uh, the gloves or the hat and the skirt, I will group them together because that makes the painting process uh, much easier and faster. Now at this point, uh, another thing I do is I'm going to go over each of my objects and turn off the dynamic subdivision just to see how they look like. Because the dynamic subdivision is something that is only applicable while you're in ZBrush. But the moment you export to another software, that will not be applied. So I just make sure that with it off, I have enough topology, usually mid to high poly enough, to be smooth in whatever software I decide to export it to. So I'm just going to go over, uh, turn, turn it off, make sure it looks good, and turn it back on. Um, and of course, as I do this, I also notice, ah, maybe I can tweak this a little bit. Ah, maybe I can tweak that. So that's usually what you see me doing, like, oh, that, maybe I missed a little part. Go back and tweak it a little bit. So yeah, this is the process where you can see I go back, turn the subdivision off. And honestly, this is why keeping your file clean is kind of important. Uh, if you have sphere 35, 36, 37, it's a bit difficult to keep track of it. So for me personally, naming everything the way that it has to be helps me structure it better. Let's see. So um, once I am done with this, the next step is poly painting. So what I like to do is I like to apply the um, ZBrush uh, material, the fast shader is what it's called, to all of the objects because it has more of a flatter look, which ultimately will blend better with my final result. Then I go ahead and apply a base color to all of my shapes, so all the oranges, the blues, 
the yellows the same way that I did the original concept. So as you can see, it's just that, just flat color. And once I'm happy with that, I will zoom in on the face, and I will use the standard brush in the RGB mode. So on the top, you will see that I have the RGB selected. That means it will only paint color and not move any of the topology. So I'll go ahead and add a little bit of blush. I add some color to the lips. I like to add some eyeshadows, paint in the eyes, um, and also add some hue variation to the clothing. So here you will see me add a bit of orange to some of the clothing just to incorporate the colors a bit better. Yeah, for this detail, I chose to paint it in. Now, once I have this, um, what I'm going to do is I need to position the head uh, correctly. So at this point, the head was symmetrical. But I'm going to go ahead and merge all the objects that are part of the head, uh, move it a little bit, uh, and position it slightly tilted. But she looks a little bit unhappy, so let's give her an expression. So here, this is a duplicate mesh. I'm going to go ahead and create a little smile. Um, make her a little bit more lively, create a little bit of an expression. It's nice to have this as a duplicate, just to make sure uh, if you want to go back to your original symmetrical sculpt, you can. <laughs> so I do that. Um, yeah, and at this point, I thought, maybe I should scale the head a little bit. So I go ahead and, again, make sure all the objects are merged. And I scale the head a little bit more, just to emphasize it, um, since I thought that that fits the style better. And also at this point, uh, the sculpt is going to be wrapped up. So I look at it as in total, and I think, OK, is there anything I can fix? Is there anything that I can do better? So one thing I noticed is that I can go over the braids and position them slightly better. And that also the color I picked in my original concept is a bit darker than what I have in the sculpt. So I'm going to go ahead, play with the position of the braids a little bit, and yeah, just darken the hair color. Go ahead and do that for both. Very slight tweaks. And we have the finished sculpt. So the next step is to create the 3D render. Now, in order to demonstrate the compatibility between the software uh, in the Max and Arsenal, I have chosen uh, Cinema 4D and Redshift to create my render with. So I begin with creating a new Cinema 4D scene. And the first thing I do is, uh, in the file, I go to the render settings and switch from standard to Redshift. And for now, I leave the default settings in. So then I'm going to go ahead and import an OBJ file, which I exported from ZBrush. Now, this OBJ file is, uh, contains all the objects together, so I haven't split anything up. It's just one mesh. Now, as you can see here, when we import it, uh, we see already the colors in. Uh, but that is because this is a default material in um, Cinema. But what I want to do is I want to create a Redshift material, which is compatible with the Redshift renderer. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new standard Redshift material and apply it to the object. <gasps> but what happens? The colors are gone. But I want them visible not only in the viewport, but also in the render. So what I have to do here is I have to open my material editor. And I'm going to add a attribute note, a vertex attribute. So here I'm going to connect the out color of the at vertex attribute note to the color inputs of the standard material. But as you can see, that gives you a very like, white result. That's not what I want. So the trick here is to go ahead and select this little tag here, which is the vertex color tag. So basically, Poly painting in ZBrush is the same as vertex colors. So when you import an OBJ file into Cinema, you will get this tag, and that contains all the color information. So I'm going to take that tag and drag and drop it into the attribute name, which is a characteristic of the vertex attribute node. And boom, we have the colors. Um, now, once I have done that, I, look that uh, I see that my character looks very shiny, and I just want a very flat overall look. So I'm just going to um, increase the roughness to 1 or 0 0.9. Now, the next step is to prepare my viewport for rendering. So I like to split my screen in two. And um, then I go ahead and I add a camera. So here I'm going to zero out the camera position and rotation, and position it slightly in front of my character. Now, the reason I like to split my screen in two is so that on the left side, I can see what my camera sees, and on the right, use that as a uh, navigation port. So at this point, I go back to my render settings. 
And here I'm going to plug in the size of A3, so the size of an uh, A3 paper. That is the aspect ratio I want in the end for my uh, illustration. So um, I make sure to also look at my concept as I do that. Um, now I tweak the camera a little bit, mainly just position, rotation, and the focal length. So honestly, this is just um, if I like the way it looks, that's my main uh, guideline. I didn't want the camera to look too crazy distorted, so this is what I end up in the end with as a result. And I also like to open the render view as I'm doing this to see okay, what in the end it's actually going to look like. Now at this point, it's time to add lighting. So I'm going to go ahead and add one area light to the scene and check in the render how that looks. So I'm only going to play with the position of the light and the intensity. So usually, um, when people create 3D renders of uh, characters or assets, they like to do the three-point setup, which is typical in photography. But in this case, I don't want to have a rim light. So I'm only going to have two lights instead of a three uh, to omit the rim on purpose. So the purpose of the two lighting is one of them is a main light, so it gives the most light to the object, and the other one is a fill light. So you can see me here, I turn them on and off to see what effect they have on my, on my result. And if they're too bright, I will turn down the intensity. Important thing, I do not touch the colors of the light, so I think I have enough color going on in the painting, so I just leave the color of the lighting to white. So go ahead and I play a little bit with the lights, the position of them. A little bit of rotation. Yes, and at this point, I was satisfied with what I have. So now I'm going to go back into my render settings. And this is an important part. I will change the DPI to 300. Now, why do I do this? Well, because I have to think that my final illustration is going to be printed on paper. And the standard in printing is 300 pixels per inch, whereas the standard for digital is 72. So I need to make sure that my render is already good quality enough uh, to print later. So I change that. Oh, and why do I choose A3? Um, well, ultimately, I print in a smaller format. But it's nice to have a bigger image just to make sure that you can scale it down if you need to. Uh, it's easier to do that than to go the other way around. So now I have all my render settings set up. Then I go to the Redshift uh, tab, and I like to decrease the noise threshold to 0 0.001. And I also like to really crank up those render settings. <laughs> now, the reason I do that is because I'm going to render only one image. So even if it takes half an hour, uh, I can afford to do that. It's not going to be a sequence. It's just one image. So crank that up to 16, and you're ready to render. So now the only thing that's left to do is to hit the Render button, let the program calculate. And with that, my render is complete. Now, in order to create the final look of my illustration, I import the 3D render uh, into Photoshop, and I begin to edit it. So what I like to do is literally paint over. I add some sketchy lines. I also add some hard shadow areas uh, following the shadow that I have already in my 3D render. I also like to um, add the orange shapes that we had in the beginning as just a flat uh, shape in the image. Mm. I also like to do as a final step, I like to add noise to the image. Uh, I do this in Photoshop, not in the render, because then this noise is applied to both the image and the background. Yeah, I also add a background uh, for the purpose of just making it look more complete. And once I'm happy with this, I can go ahead and create some real life uh, products. So what I like to do is I like to create art prints, stickers, and bookmarks. And I actually have brought some to show you here today. So this is a little bit smaller than A5. So we go ahead and can print this. Then we have bookmarks. As you can see, it's a variation of the design. Just to copy the oranges a bit further. Voila, you have a bookmark. And make it minimized. And then we have stickers. So in this way, you can have one illustration and have a variety of products to choose from and create. Yeah, 
So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. This is how I like to combine 2D with 3D and how I incorporate ZBrush into my design process. If you're interested in following my personal work, it will be available on my website, www.monsatelia.com. You can also find me on Instagram under the same tag. And if you're interested in my regular uh, professional work, you can also find me on ArtStation under Simona Todorova. Thank you.